Hi, uh, this is this is Janet Fitch, and if it is noon on Wednesday, uh, it is Writing Wednesday, where I uh, talk about your writing questions, um, uh, craft questions, you know, spiritual questions, everything having to do with writing, um, and uh, I urge you to, you know, if you uh, have a question um, and you're here live, uh, put your questions in the comments. I definitely have time for, uh, I have time for, to answer your questions. And um, I have questions that people have sent me today um, for the, for the, uh, the experience. Um, uh, and if you want a question, if you want a Writing Wednesday designed around your question, uh, send me questions at uh, on my website, JanetFitchWrites.com, uh, and I could design a whole um, uh, show for you. Because uh, if you have a question, uh, there are 20 other people who have the same question uh, and might be a little shy about asking. Um, I am... Uh, getting ready to teach a class on point of view this weekend, uh, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, May 11th, uh, May 13th to 15th, uh, through the community of writers.org and, uh, registration is still open. So if you are interested in, uh, taking a tour of point of view, uh, something we usually don't have time to do as writers, we often don't stop and really ask ourselves what's the best way to tell the story because there's a story and then there's how it's told and how it's told is the book not the story so we're going to take a deep look into that and uh, it, it, there's still enrollment still open uh, it starts friday evening uh, at five pacific uh, and whatever that is eight o'clock uh, eastern and, and in the middle. Um, and uh, sessions are recorded for participants. So if you miss one uh, of the sessions, you can go back and pick it up before the next class, the next session, or, you know, after the, after it's over. So uh, we do have questions today. And uh, good to see everybody. I'm glad you're uh, glad to see you here. And so we have questions uh, today. Malaika wrote to me. She has a student who uh, she was very intrigued by seeing my um, in my writer's notebooks. And, you know, I keep everything in ring binders because um, um, I find it's easier to uh, find things if they're spatially located in real uh, real reality. Hi, Lisa. Um, and I always like to, um, you know, so I use the ring binders uh, and recommend that to people. You know, I know some people are extremely well organized on their computers and, you know, everything's at their fingertips. But I find a book is far, uh, is better technology. It just is easier to use. And so Malaika um, was very interested in the fact that I uh, keep a um, a running list of really good opening lines and opening paragraphs in, in my writer's notebook. If I come across something good, uh, my memory, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have a photographic memory, you know, so I make sure to write the paragraph or the sentence. Often I don't even say who the, especially in times past, I have not said who the author is. Um, sometimes that's irksome. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't want to let like really good openings, really good endings, um, and, uh, and there and disappear into the universe, um, which they will, uh, if it's up to me. So I always write them down and I put them in my notebook. I have an old, I just re-salvage old notebooks. So this one is, uh, you know, from an old class I used to teach called Take Charge for Promising Young junior high age students uh, to help with um, you know, boosting uh, skills. 
And I have a bunch of these notebooks, so I use them. And uh, this one, notebook three, um, has lists, uh, a lot of lists. And one of them is my first and last. And she was, so Malika, if you're watching, um, she also teaches, and, and she said a student of hers was very interested in the first, now the last, last paragraphs, last lines. Now, why do I even bother uh, collecting these? Because you, you know, your, your opening is your doorway, is your invitation to the reader to come in and join, join your story. Um, I think that short story openings, short stories have to start off the block. They have to, that's a 50 yard dash. So there's no time to waste. They have to get you into, not only into the story, but into the writing style, the concerns of the author, the concerns of the story. They have to get you right in there. Novel openings are usually slower. They unfold the world. They allow the reader to figure out where they are. Um, but sometimes it's introdu introduction to language, you know, like um, the opening to Moby Dick, you know, call me Ishmael, uh, uh, you know, talking about being in the watery world of, that will end up being the watery world of Moby Dick. Um, it gets you into the language immediately. Melville was big on the Bible and Shakespeare, and boy, you know, those sentences really, uh, the opening of Moby Dick really uh, gives you a sense of the scope of the, the book that it's going to be and uh, of the cadence of that language. Um, let's see if I have Moby Dick available. Oh, yes, I do, because I'm going to teach a point of view. And I'm actually going to use it for that, too. So uh, let's see where Moby is. I can, you can get a feeling for the grandeur of that language. Um, maybe if I, if I can find it offhand. So it's an idea. It's a first-person novel. So it'll be under first person. And... Um, Let's see if I can find it. But it's a wonderful opening because it gives you the sense of that almost biblical style of, of writing. Um, that's going to be your... Oh, Moby, where did I put you? Um, first person. <laughs> Looking in the wrong place. Okay. Um, here we go. For a little taste. Hey, Lewis. Good to see you. Oh my God, isn't that amazing? Um, so Lewis uh, is taking that uh, is taking that point of view class as well, uh, and is already reading one of my one of my selections. Um, but I need Moby Dick is what I want to show you, without having to get up from my desk here. <laughs> Yeah, finding anything on short notice. There we go. So listen to this. This is the opening of Moby Dick. Call me Ishmael, uh, which is an unlucky character in the Bible. So we're already biblical, and we're already uh, have an omen of things to come, right? Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, so we're interrupting ourselves already, so we see that's going to be part of it. Having little or no money in my purse, and nothing particularly to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Well, what a wonderful opening. So the scene is set, tone is set, uh, narrator is set. Um, it is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. So it's a physical, going to be a physical book. It's setting us up, right? Um, whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is 
a damp, drizzly November in my soul. We're getting a rhythm, a very biblical rhythm. Whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially wherever, so four wherevers, this is a long sentence, it's almost begot, 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 um, wherever, whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral purpose to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to see as soon as I can, period. So we're getting a feel for the book already. The, uh, the cadences of language, the, uh, the fact that it's going to be a watery world, the fact that it's a kind of a gloomy guy, um, uh, all of that is in the first, in the opening. So openings are very important. That's, you know, that's, that's the, the lobby of your novel. That's the invite, the front door. That, that's inviting them in. It's telling them where they are, who's, you know, what's the, who's telling the story, what the expectation of cadence. Hi, Malika, I'm doing your question. Um, and uh, short stories start with a punch. So here's my, uh, I'm going to turn the camera around so you can see my the notebook here. Um, okay, so here are my firsts. They look like this. Um, you know, just I if I find a good first line in a story I'm reading, I read it. So short stories grab your attention. So here are short story openings. In the spring of 1960, I turned 20. That's a good opening. I didn't see my friend Walter for many years. That's a good opening. Put it down, she says, you know. Down at Hollywell, we have five houses, three large and two small. That's a great opening because then you're going, oh, yeah, five houses. Where? And where's Hollywell? And why do you have five houses? Uh, it happened slowly and it happened twice. So that makes us wonder, what is it? Um, when I was six and Elizabeth was five, our parents took us to, the, to Europe with them for the summer. So these all start, you start asking yourself questions about the, what is going to happen. You get a, an idea, is this a child narrator? Is this an adult narrator? I see that numbers are very nice in a first, because then you want a group, like what, what group is that? Um, uh, for four days, the, lay, the letter lay unnoticed on the hall floor. Well, there we go, you know. That's off and running, off the blocks. Um, then, but the Malika's question is about endings, because um, the ending kind of is the big bell that moves back through the story or back through the novel and resonates. It also opens a little as well, well as shutting down. It op op closes this chapter and maybe cracks open the next chapter slightly. So um, whenever you run into good opening, write it down. First sentence, first paragraph, and put it in your writer's notebook. Not because you're going to imitate it, but it gives you some idea of how a good opening that appealed to you, how it works. You know, what might go into a first sentence in a short story or what goes into a first paragraph in a novel? How, how does that set up? Because usually the beginning of uh, a novel or a short story is not the first thing that you write. Usually you go back and craft an opening or, um, to a novel certainly for a novel, but often for a short story. Um, you know, you go back and craft a better front door and, you know, foyer um, that more suits the ending that you finally reached. Uh, usually your, your first opening isn't necessarily, sometimes it can be, but often it's not.
uh, often it's something that has to go back and be reweighted. So then we look at endings, and I certainly, uh, one of the questions, as a matter of fact, that I got, not from you, Malika, but from uh, uh, another, uh, another querent, um, says, um, uh, asked to, you know, how should we write a first paragraph? So here we go. That's what we're talking about. And um, what is the most cliche way to start a novel? which I think is super interesting. What is the most cliche way to start a novel? Um, my uh, teacher, Kate Braverman, uh, used to say, uh, you, you may not start a novel or a short story with somebody waking up in a cold sweat because there's a lot of student work <laughs> where somebody wakes up in a cold sweat. And then I just read um, a book about uh, of students' memories of a uh, writer who's very much with us, but he's retiring, uh, Jim Crusoe. And he had something else he disliked in an, in the opening of a... Um, it wasn't waking up in a cold sweat. Mm, it's gone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I I'll try to write it down when we finish today. I'll write it in the comments so you can have it. Um, you, in a novel, this is about a novel opening. Um, the biggest cliches are starting with dialogue. You know, that's something that people think really attracts a lot of attention. But we hear from people we don't know, we don't care, and we don't know. Um, I like to start with placing us somewhere that we know where we are, you know. Or if you're in first person and it's a voice-oriented book, um, <clears throat> give us a chance to hear that voice and give us a feeling of settling in. So big cliches are, you know, starting with an action scene, you know, starting in the middle. I don't go for starting in the middle, maybe in a short story, but not in a novel. Um, you want to kind of... Um, know who's talking, where we are, what kind of diction is this going to be, what kind of story is this going to be, you know, I want intimations of that. And then the endings, that's what Malika's student uh, wanted to know, uh, to take a look at endings. So here are some of my endings that I've collected over the years, and I, I've got to say there are people in here I, I when I was collecting them, I didn't bother to note whose book, what book it is, and what author it is. I just admired the ending, and I just grabbed it. So um, there is a uh, you know very famous short story, "Goodbye, My Brother," from uh, John Cheever. So I actually recognized the chapter, even uh, the the uh, paragraph, even though uh, I didn't say what it was. Um, May asks, how about starting with weather? Uh, I think weather is wonderful. You know, you have to watch, you know, it was a dark and stormy night. You've got to do it uh, more nicely than that. If you, but I don't see anything wrong with weather. Human beings, you know, the weather, any animal, uh, the weather is very important and we really respond to it because we've, you know, as a species, we've had to seek shelter from the weather. Uh, um, that's probably one of the biggest priorities of any uh, animal, is thinking about shelter and thinking about the weather. So it's a very good place to open, um, especially if as you move it towards the story. So, um, uh, you know, having the, uh, you know, the hot wind. I, I started White Olean with the, with the Santa Anas, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think wind is, uh, if emotion is incorporated in, in symbol, you know, in it's uh, symbolic of emotion, certainly, you know. 
the wind, you know, you're in the doldrums on a boat and nothing's blowing. That certainly, you know, indicates kind of the becalmed life, right? Uh, the heavy smog that lay on the city, you know, uh, like a dead dog, <laughs> like a dead dog. You know, it tells you a lot about the character and where they are and so forth. So, of course. So endings, um, you know, I grab them. When I see a good ending, I grab it. And notice how the ending ends something but opens up something in the future, um, like this one. Um, um, oh, where is it? There was one of them that was very good at, at uh, I don't see it. Oh, well. And here's one. Both David and Mrs. Fulton taught me a lot about caring. So this is kind of a summer, summarizing an emotion, or summarizing where you've gotten to in the story. Um, they taught me a lot about caring, about sex, about love. I taught myself about pain. It has to mean something to be put to use, caring use. Otherwise, it just kills you, and I don't want to die. That's a, I just thought that was such a good ending for a short story. Um, sometimes it's, it's focal length, so it's pulling back. You've been in the story, deep in the story, and then you pull back and get a little perspective. So here's another one. How old was I then, 16? 16 is young, but it can also be a grown man. I am 41 years old now, and I think about that time without regret, though my mother and I never talked that way in that way again, and I have not heard her voice now for a long, long time. So he obviously was in there with his mother and in there with at 16 and whatever, and then the ending pulls back, the camera pulls back, what I call focal length, you're getting better, bigger focal length and saying something about uh, life. Uh, that's another really good way to handle an ending. There's also, um, this is an actioner, shoot an eye cross and shake hands. The whistle blows. Through me flows the power to blast Grand Coulee Dam to smithereens. So it's something about those two people being able to shake hands, you know, is so momentous. Uh, so uh, Lewis says to look at um, Kerouac's ending to Dr. Sachs after many uh, pages of stream of consciousness screed. He ends with classic two-word affirmation. That's neat. Um, there is um, this is a this is a classic uh, called "Good from Goodbye My Brother" by Cheever, and Cheever is a really good short story writer. This is very very oh the ending to Great Gatsby absolutely. Um, this is the ending of this Cheever story, Goodbye, My Brother. And this is a very famous ending, so I, I have to show this to you. Uh, oh, what can you do with a man like that? So we, we presume we've been in a story, deep into the story about somebody in particular, right? And then we start to pull back. Oh, what can you do with a man like that? What can you do? How can you dissuade his eye in a crowd from seeking out the cheek with acne, the infirm hand? How can you teach him to respond to the inestim inestimable greatness of the race, the harsh surface of beauty of life? How can you put his finger for him on the obdurate truths before which fear and horror are powerless? The see that more, so we pull out, and we're going to have, we have some big thoughts, and then we're going to tip in again. So we're, fear and honor are powerless, so we're getting to big issues, big abstract issues, and now we're going to kind of tip over back into life, uh, into image and scene. Um, the see that morning, whenever you say that morning, then you're back in the world. 
Uh, the sea that morning was iridescent and dark. My wife and sister were swimming, Diana and Helen, and I saw their uncovered heads, black and gold, in the dark water. I saw them come out, and I saw they were naked, unshy, beautiful, and full of grace, and I watched the naked women walk out of the sea. One of the great endings uh, in American literature. It also, it's like the first part of that paragraph is saying, how can you explain grace to this thick-headed person, this man that we've been dealing with? Um, the beauty of life, uh, uh, the harsh surface beauty of life. How do you put the finger, on, that finger, your finger on it for him? And then the narrator does it in the second part of the sentence by watching these women arise from the sea, you know, in a moment of grace and beauty, exactly what he would like his obdurate brother to see, or I think it's a brother. But he certainly brings the reader to that point of beauty by pointing it out, by creating it and crafting it that way. Um, uh, the the ending of The Great Gatsby uh, that Linda is referring to, the focal length ending reminds me of The uh, the Great Gatsby. God, I had all these books. I just cleaned my office getting ready for this class. Um, is about the boats beating endlessly against the tide. You know, so that's human life is that striving and going back into the past, uh, which were, you know, were. That was one of the main themes of Gatsby and receding into the past in the boats. Um, and so that rings the big bell that moves backwards through the book um, and kind of knits the whole thing together in your, in your consciousness and your, I don't know if people believe in the soul, but I do. So it's like the, you know, resonates in the soul and uh, pins it there. You know, that experience becomes this resonant, perfect experience because it ends well. And, uh, here's another one that I know, I know which book it is. Um, this is the ending for a short story called, um, uh, it's Goodbye and Keep Cold. And that is a, that is the title. So now we know. So sometimes if it ends on the intimation of a title, that, that certainly resonates because you're, reading the whole story, wondering what, you know, where did that come from? So this is, Mama walked off from the people who raised her and never looked back. I don't want to do that, but I do want to be free of them, want them in perspective, want myself apart. I need to shake them loose, let go. Charlie says everybody has to raise their parents. Is that true? He says the time comes for all of us when we have to kiss them goodbye and trust them to be okay on their own. I've done the best I could with mine. Goodbye, you all, and good luck. Goodbye and keep cold. So that's a farewell, you know, saying the characters knitted together whatever they needed to learn from whatever the story was about and are able to say goodbye. And then also ring the little chime of the title. That's a sweet move. So, you know, it's just typing it up, typing it up, putting in a notebook, you know, and uh, then looking at it from time to time and kind of savoring what, you know, what the, what the, um, what the author has done. Oh, people like that. Okay. Here's some uh, other questions we have. Um, as a writer, is it harder to write the beginning of the book or the end? Um, well, I think that actually people go back and usually rewrite the beginning to make sure that it's really a good entrance. Um, but sometimes people get a really good beginning um, right away. Um, the ending is hard. The ending is always hard because the ending is the proof. It's like a mathematical proof. Uh, you can't get the ending without writing the story. And 
without knowing what it's about. Like, what what are you ending? And then where, you know, handling how you, do you want to pull back from it? Do you want to pull back from it and tip forward? Do you want to step to one side? Do you, what is it that you wanted to show about your story? Um, how do you ring the gong? Um, what is going to linger in the mind? Um, usually it's not an action scene. Usually it comes out of it. It comes after the ending, sort of. Um, it gives you one more note that both closes off and opens up an idea sometimes. Um, let's see what we have here. Um, so I think that it's harder to write the ending. Writers will write. I mean, sometimes you get lucky, but most writers rewrite the ending over and over and over and over again. Um, I, you know, to do 10 drafts, 20 drafts of the ending, the last page, the last scene, the last paragraph, the endings of everything are the most important. Um, the most important place in a sentence is at the end. So you put your most striking language at the end. The most important place in a paragraph is the last sentence you want to punch out. If you have, say, a punch out sentence and then you have another sentence, you're actually uh, decreasing the power of the strongest sentence by trailing off. Never trail off. If you need to say that last little bit, find a way to fold it into the paragraph so you can end on the strongest note. The strongest place in the scene is at the end. Strongest place in the chapter is at the end. And the strongest place in the novel is at the end. So you work your butts off to get that really resonant. And when I say punch you in the face, it's like the thing that resonates, the thing that's that um, makes an impact. Um, so yes, uh, harder to write the ending. Uh, how should we write the first paragraph? You know, locate us, and then if you are writing a short story, you've got to get off the blocks and start the story. You, it's not just set up. You have to start and get going in the first paragraph, not in a novel. Um, let's see how we doing. Genre and ending. What is expected by readers? I think good writing is good writing, regardless of genre. You know, I think the resonance, the resonant ending that's going to reverb and stay with you is just as important in sci-fi or romance or western or any story as any other story you know i in storytelling this is a storytelling thing and in storytelling good storytelling goes across the board um what's expected is um, a feeling of closure and then a little bit of what comes next. What's What should we expect of the future? Um, a feeling of hope, a feeling of continuation, a feeling of, of a new page. Um, and I just think that all fiction will have that. Um, let's see if there's any other questions that I've missed. Um, here's another question, um, which I love this one. My main character is too self-pitying. How do I write his emotions in a way that allows the reader to sympathize and doesn't make them want to throw the book across the room? That is a great question. The more self-pitying the character is, the less the reader, uh, the less patience the reader has with them. You know, a self-pitying character, you want some 
bad happened to them. You know, oh, poor me, I'm sitting at the bar. Oh, you know, and then somebody comes in and, it, you know, it's like, who are you looking at? It's like, yeah, why don't you punch him in the face? <laughs> Whereas if a character is in difficulty, um, you know, terrible things are happening to them and they struggle not to go under. They don't succumb to self-pity. We are going to really care about that person because they are trying. They are really trying. Um, it's the old thing of, you know, don't have your character cry, you know, make the reader cry. Um, so the more the character can battle their, their despair, the more a character can um, not succumb to self-pity, uh, the more interested we're going to be. I noticed that with um, um, working with Astrid in... in White Oleander, you know, she has a terrible situation with her mother in prison and going through the foster care system, but very rarely does she succumb to self-pity. I think there's one special, especially one scene where she just can't find a way out. Um, but she's really earned it. So we've seen that whole journey. And when she find, when she does succumb to self-pity, um, she's earned it. And it doesn't last all that long. You know, she's always trying to get out of her situation or make something work that's not working. Um, so they'll sympathize with your character as they battle their, so, you know, battle against despair. Um, when they succumb to it, um, you don't get, don't stay there too long. Um, so Mrs. Grummage and David Copperfield, Linda says, uh, ends up just being funny. Yeah, well, Dickens makes fun of her, you know, because, he, you know, a self-pitying character doesn't need the reader's pity because they already are having their own little pity party. Um, so Dickens makes her an object of fun. Um, here's another question. Um, why can't I finish my novel as planned? Why does it take so long? What am I doing wrong? That's right. The novel is not a fast form. You know, if you don't like the time it takes, write short stories. You know, novels, I mean... For me, I can't tell you the last time I wrote a novel in four years. You know, for me, it's it's five, four, five, six years for a novel. I'm slow. I'm particularly slow. Um, but uh, it takes a long time. So that's the first answer. The second answer is, why can't I finish my novel as planned? Um because once you start writing your novel, you know more about it than you did when you began. So it's natural that the novel becomes itself and not what you had planned. Uh, you know, it's just like you can plan what your life is going to be like when you're 14. and go, ah, it's going to be like this and that. But then you actually have your life and... You have to let go of what you, not completely, you know, you always keep in mind, you know, I really wanted to be a pirate or whatever. You know, maybe you're not going <laughs> to be a pirate, but there was something about that, that pirate fantasy that you might work into your, um, into your uh, current life. Maybe you want to learn to sail a square rigger or something. You know, do, you know, work on a tall ship or go sailing or watch movies about sailing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, those early ideas about what your novel is going to be change tre tremendously once it starts uh, becoming a real thing. 
uh, there's no such thing as perfection in the physical world. I know, you know, anybody who knows me has heard me say that more than once. Um, there is, the, the only perfection is what's in your head. And if you're actually going to try to create something in the physical world, it's not going to be the same. So you have to let that go. Although, you know, if you start a novel and you want to write about, um, you know, a difficult decision, say Sophie's choice, you know, she was forced to choose between her children in a uh, uh, life or death um, concentration camp situation and the aftermath of that. Um, maybe you know that that's going to be the central event, but how do you get there? Who's going to be telling the story? All these things you won't know until you start. It's a journey. You know, you can't know the journey before you take the journey. Um, so, uh, and then what am I doing wrong? You're doing nothing wrong. You're just, you need to get used to the idea that the novel in your head, it was a fantasy. And the novel that's taking shape uh, as you go is the novel. Um, that's what, I remember my teacher, Kate Braverman, who was always a very uh, uh, good at uh, uh, epigraph, uh, epigrammatic uh, type of thinker, you know, said there's the novel in your head and there's the novel on the page and there's only the novel on the page. My gift to you. Um, all right, here's another one. Um, what is the single biggest reason for the rejection of novice writers? Is it different in the various genres of fiction? Probably. Um, I'd say the biggest reason for rejection of novice writing is not writing in scenes not writing in scenes, not knowing enough to write in scenes. The second is um, not mas having any mastery of the sentence, you know, just writing bad sentences, not recognizing a cliche. So the thing is cliche ridden. You know, I know that that is a really common cause of rejecting, I mean, as a reader, I see that and that's it for me. You know, anything you've ever seen before in print um, is a cliche and needs to be uh, rethought. So, you know, cliched language, cliche, you know, roll, eye rolling. I see eye rolling. I'm gone, you know. Uh, hair tossing, eye rolling, um, um, cliched combinations of words, fire engine red, you know. Can't do better than that. Um, so the cliche, ban the cliche, uh, learn to write an interesting sentence, good verbs, um, write in scenes, also bad dialogue, you know, writing pages and pages of natural sounding dialogue, like you exchange with your neighbor instead of, um, conflict specific, compressed, um, dialogue that's about conflict. Um, so those are some of the things that would, uh, that are the commonest reasons for your writing to be rejected. Um, is it different for various genres of fiction? I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. I think that the reader of genre fiction, what you'd call genre fiction, each genre has its requirements that are, uh, um, allow kind of a softer tolerance of in other parts of the writing. Um, invention is very important, you know, and probably language a little less important. You know, as a teacher of writing, I'd rather see, I'd like to see good writing in all genres of, <laughs> of writing. I want to see good writing, but I'll admit that in uh, science fiction, the invention, the world building, um, the control of plot and scene, um, 
also mystery writing. Sensuality is very important in mystery writing, you know, to physically put people in the body of the book, uh, of the characters. Uh, location is really big in mystery and world building in in uh, sci-fi. Um, so, and the reader's a little more tolerant of writing that isn't all that fabulous. But if your writing is really fabulous as well as your genre control, you're going to have a double audience. You're going to have literary audience who's going to read you for, you know, because you're a really good storyteller. And then the genre reader is going to read you because you're a fabulous sci-fi writer. So then William Gibson, you know, you're going to get, get it all. Um, so Lisa says, can you talk about the logic underpinning Les Plesko's admonition, don't have ideas? Oh, well, Les Plesko was a fantastic writer, um, really high-end literary writer uh, who I was in that Braverman workshop with, and he went on to teach for 20 years at UCLA um, uh, Extension. And he used to say, don't have ideas. And so that applies to this question, why can't I finish my novel as planned? Uh, Les used to say, don't have ideas. Don't know what you want to do with your story. Just write and P-L-E-S-K-O. Les, uh, L-E-S, P-L-E-S-K-O. So his books are... Uh, um, uh, the Last Bongo Sunset and uh, No Stopping Train uh, about the Hungarian Revolution that uh, was published posthumously. Uh, he was a fantastic writer. And uh, in teaching, he always, in workshop, he would say, don't have ideas, like what I wanted to do with this. And it's like, no, you see what you're doing, what you just did, and then you you go on with that. Um, you go where the book is going rather than having ideas of where it should go. And it's kind of a paradox. It's kind of a koan because it's, it's impossible to write without having some idea of what you're doing. But what he meant was hold it very lightly. Hold those ideas very lightly. And if something else is happening, notice that that's what's alive and go with that rather than your idea about what you wanted to do. Um, so here's a related question. Um, are there any cliches, writing styles, plot lines, or matters of subject that aspiring unpublished writers should avoid? Well, this is funny. I have a... Um, I was asked this on a on a different website called Quora about, you know, what are the biggest traps for young writers? And uh, the the character with nothing left to lose is the biggest trap in the world. Because if they have nothing left to lose, then the writer's got to push that train up the hill. You know, that is not fun. If you have a character who wants something, who does have something to lose, that character will drive your story. If they have nothing to lose, then, you know, they're not going to, they're just going to sit there and drink or whatever they're, you know, go to the market. They just don't give a shit. <laughs> Very hard to get that story to do anything <laughs> with a character like that. Cliches to avoid all cliches. Anything you have ever heard before, ever, is a cliche. And, or read, anyway. And just don't use it. Don't use it. Use your own imagination to come up with your own metaphors, your own ways of describing things, rather than borrowed language, which is what a cliche is. Uh, you know, that's hard work. That's the heavy lifting. Um, are there any writing styles that should be avoided? No. Uh, 
uh, we're going to be doing this point of view class this weekend, and I'll be looking at uh, point of points of view which are help which help the writer, and then points of view that are more challenging to the writer. I mean, some of the points of view ways of telling a story are, you know, will help you, and some are more challenging. But you, for every challenging point of view, there are brilliant books that have been written that way. So it's just knowing what's going to be a little trickier to handle and then what's going to be easier and more helpful to you. Um, plot lines. I find that I like a sing single protagonist. I think it's easier to make an ending to a book that has a one protagonist. If you have multiple points of view or you're using omniscient point of view, um, the reader, the downs, they, they're very flexible and interesting forms, but one of the downsides is that it's harder to, for the reader to identify with any one character, so that when it comes down to closing out the book and giving the big gong, You've divide, the reader has divided their attention among so many characters that it's hard to bring the book together and get that last burst uh, over 15 different characters. It just, it's going to be harder to end it. So that's, I, you know, rather than recommending things to avoid, you know, it's like know that certain things are harder. Uh, so if it's your first time, you might not want to do the hardest thing first. Although some people want to do the hardest thing first, just to see if they can do it. Um, so recommended that maybe avoid that, but not necessarily. The cliche you can always avoid. Always, always, always. The difficulty with people who haven't read widely is they don't know that it's already been done. You know, people who like to start with dialogue, start with a line of dialogue, boom, you know, uh, that is, seems very innovative until you've seen hundreds of not very good works that start that way. And then it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> that's not as innovative as I thought it was. <laughs> um, plot lines. You know, you just have to notice when they're coming up, if you're not pushing your characters, if everybody likes each other and it's all huggy and stuff, if there's not enough happening, if there's not conflict, if you're avoiding conflict in your writing, it's okay to avoid conflict in your life. That's great. That's what therapy is for. Um, but you don't want to avoid conflict in your fiction. You don't want to make things easy for your character. You don't want people to almost get a big boo-boo. You know, somebody almost gets their face punched in, but they talk their way out of it. You know, no, just have them get hit. Let the blows land. Uh, that's, there's a tip for you. So Linda asks, what about a character with nothing left to lose who's sitting there at the bar drinking and talking, but through the talking we get to see that he really cares about? Well, then he's not a character with nothing to lose, right? He just appears that way. I'm talking about somebody who really feels that way. Um, so it's one thing that, that a character who appears that way, but actually, you know, has something very much to lose. Uh, if they have nothing to lose, if they've already lost it all, that's a tricky character for a new writer to handle. And I would say avoid, avoid that. Um, oh, and Lisa, that's nice. So Lisa put in a, uh, uh, a, a link for my point of view class this weekend. If there's still, there's still space available. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. Hi, Zunaid. Good to see you. Uh, so that seems like a very good place to end. Uh, I thank you for joining me for Writing Wednesday. I hope you join uh, 
you know, you might join the us for point of view this weekend. It's going to be really, um, you know, a chance to really look at the subject in a systematic way, which uh, we rarely get to do just because we're too preoccupied by our own stories. Uh, thank you, Lewis. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a really good week, and we'll see you next week for Writing Wednesday. Okay, bye.